Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. So I'm going to talk about uh, some new results about product free sets in the algorithmic group. This is joint work with Peter Kivers and Norm Lifitz, and it's actually kind of a work in progress. So some places I'm going to say that this, you know, this is something that we partly still working on. So what is the problem? So we have some group, G, with a product, let's say, and we say a set A in G contains a product. If there are A and B, or say A1, A, A2, in A such that the product of A1 and A2 also falls inside A. Uh, if A doesn't contain a product, we naturally say that it is product free. So this is the definition. Now the main question or the main type of question that uh, we are interested in is the following. So I give you some group and I ask you, what is the size of the largest product free set? in A. Okay, so this is the type of external problem that we're interested in in this work. Okay, so let's start with uh, some easy case for warm up. So uh, yeah, okay. And oftentimes I'm not going to talk about the size of the set, but rather about the density of the set, which is simply the normalized size. So uh, mu A is equal to the size of A divided by the total size of the group. So let's consider a special case. So what happens if G is a billion, let's say even cyclic. So does anybody have any suggestion as to what what are uh, some nice product free sets in this case? Yeah, so in this case, uh, one can take a very simple example. Take G to be a generator. And then pick the set. A, which is odd powers of G. So you can uh, easily say that this is product free and it roughly contains half of the elements in the group. And you can sort of extend it to uh, general abelian groups. So the question that you ask is really only interesting in the non-abelian case. Okay, and this is actually a question um, that uh, people have studied for uh, some time. And uh, one very relevant result uh, to this talk is uh, uh, a result by Gowers. So here is a general result for non-abelian groups. So Gowers identified a parameter that sort of says how non-abelian your group is which is the dimension of the uh, smallest non-trivial representation of G. And he showed a bound on the size of the product, large product free set as a function of that. So formally, if the dimension of the smallest non-trivial representation 
of the group is it this okay then uh, the measure of the largest product free set is at most o of one over k to the third uh, if a is product free Okay, so this is the result of Gower's. And you see, this is something very general. It holds for whatever group you'd like. So this is very good, but it probably says that uh, there are many, many cases in which in it, it is not tight, and then you can ask what you can do better. But actually, before I, I do that, let me tell you that actually Gower's proves something stronger, actually much stronger. So instead of asking uh, whether your set is product free or not, you can ask how many products does your set contain? And that was actually managed to answer this question very kind of nicely, showing that unless your sets are very, very small, uh, it is kind of like a random, the random case. So we prove that if A, B, C are sets in G, with densities alpha, beta, gamma, respectively. Then, if you count the number of A, B, C, and D sets that form a product, and you normalize appropriately, this is kind of like in the random case, as if you picked A, B, and C in random, up to some error bound. Okay, so if you think about it for a couple of minutes, you see that uh, the second result of Gower's uh, implies the first one. It's very easy to see, but it tells you something much stronger. Um, yeah, so, so this, uh, this is what Gower's proved. And then he asked for several groups uh, whether this result can be improved. And some cases of interest are the alternative group. So there are a few cases of interest. So one of them is the alternate group, which is the main topic of discussion today. But there are other ones like uh, SOM, and there are a few more that uh, he mentions in his paper. Okay. So the main topic of today is the alternate group. Any questions so far? Maybe just a quick comment about um, the abelian case. I think you might have slightly oversimplified the situation there. Doesn't what you say only apply when G has even size? Yes, yeah, so I said that it's roughly half of the group, but uh, what I, but it is certainly constant. So I think of the group as large. And I only claim that this set is uh, of constant density. But you're right that. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's not even. If G has odd order, the set you've written there will actually be the whole group, I think. Um, well, it might be. Anyway, yeah. it, it's, it's, not, it's not so relevant to your talk. Okay. I think it just means take N up to half the order of a group, as I think you know. Mm -hmm. um, Oh yeah, maybe maybe you need to be more careful with uh, 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I need to. I mean, it, the, the largest density is a third, right? In the in when you've got yeah. a, a cyclic group of prime order. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, probably need to say something like that. Like n is between like a third g and two thirds, something like that. Yeah. 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 Maybe. Okay. I need to think about it, but but thank you for the comment. Okay. So what about the alternate group? Well, so uh, so for an um, Eberhard, so uh, the host today uh, has proved a, a better result. So uh, for a n, the size of the smallest uh, representation is n. So if you use Gower's result, you get like one over n to the third. And John managed to improve that. So so Sean proved that uh, if a is product free. then the density of A is at most uh, one over square root of N up to some polylogs. So I think that, you know, seven over two, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a uh, much better than what Gauss theorem tells you. And just like in Gauss case, Sean actually proved something stronger, but not as strong as uh, uh, what Gauss proved. So actually, um, so when you look at uh, this result, at this theorem two, it tells you that you are two-sided, you are very close to random. You are not more than that, and you are not less than that. Uh, but John managed to prove that you are not much worse than that. So, then the number of products. up to normalization is at least what it would be um, in the random case, where a little of one is some, uh, uh, is, is uh, yeah, so we need the alphabet and gamma to be not too small. Okay, so this is the result that he proved, and he also mentions that uh, there are product free sets whose density is at least one over root n. So the question that the- What's the hypothesis in the slower bound? Sorry? What is the hypothesis in the slower bound? Uh, so, so there is a, set, a product we set whose density is one over root n. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the one minus little of one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the hypothesis here is that the pairwise products uh, are at least like uh, log to the seven n over n, something like that. So none of them is too small, kind of. I'm just trying to understand the line above. You say something like ABC is a subset of AN product free, or what is what is that? Yeah, sorry, sorry, no, I I messed it up. Sorry. So, uh, with density. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. So this is what he proved, and he also mentioned that there are product free sets with size at least with density at least one over root n. So I'm going to show this, this example in a moment, but then the question becomes: so what is the right answer? Do you need all of these uh, polylog factors, or is the answer simply one over root n? So let's just see an example. because it's kind of important for the rest of the talk. So what is the example? Well, you can take all permutations that map the first element to the, uh, like, two to root n. So if you sort of take a permutation at random, this happens with probability one over root n. But then you want to make sure that there is no product, so you map these elements not to themselves. So at least heuristically, you can see that if you think about picking a permutation at random, the second condition holds with constant probability, because it's like square root of n events with probability one minus one over root n. The first event holds with probability one over root n. So we can prove that density of A is at least one over root n. And uh, you can easily see that uh, A is product free, because uh, if you have pi and tau in A, then you know that pi of tau of one is something not in the first score of n elements. So, uh, yeah. So this is uh, the state of knowledge uh, prior to our work, and I will tell you uh, our result, unless there are any questions about this example or anything that I said so far. Okay. Uh, so the main result of this work is that the right answer is one over root n. So if you have a product free set in a n, then its density is at most of one over root n. Okay, so this is the main result, and now um, I, I want to ask uh, a question about the result. So yeah. do you, can you get a sharp constant instead of the big O there? So that's a good question. So this is something that we are still trying to figure out. So there are a few things that I can tell you for sure. So we can prove some stability results. We can prove that um, if you are, sorry, I forgot product three. So we can say that if you are product free, then you must be close to some sort of union of constantly many examples like, uh, like that. So that's something we, we can certainly prove. And we think that we can improve that even to like one family like that, but this is still something we're trying to figure out. And, and that may lead us to the sharp constant, but we don't have yet, that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. So let me uh, say a few remarks. So uh, the first one I kind of already said. So 
Uh, we have a weak stability result. Uh, saying that uh, if you have a product free set, then you are close. And when I say close, I mean like epsilon over root and close. to a union of, of one that depends on epsilon, uh, many families like, uh, like this family, I'll call, I'll call it star. And uh, so we think that uh, we may have a stronger result, uh, but this is still something uh, that we're doing. So maybe stronger and, and sharp constant. So that's one remark. And the second remark is that we also know uh, the cross version of the problem. So we also have results for the cross version. Um, namely, uh, if a B, C, or set such that there is no solution to A, B equals to C. Then one of them must be somewhat small. And here, somewhat small, uh, it turns out to be of square root of log n over n. Sorry, over square root of n. Yeah. And this is uh, also tight. And uh, yeah, thirdly, I'll just say it and I'll not write it. So the method that we have is kind of general in the sense that uh, it has a potential to, to be applied in different places and actually this is something that we are kind of also looking at but uh, but this is beyond the scope of what i'm going to talk about where does that extra log n factor come from where a b and c are different um so you can play around with this example uh, and once you have three families you can make one of the, uh, like this root n or that root n slightly different. And like you can, you can uh, add some square root of log n factor uh, because you, you kind of need only one of these events to be large. So, uh, yeah. Okay, and when, when you say you might be able to apply these things to other problems, do you mean potentially product free sets in other groups such as SL2 of FP? So that's, that's something that we didn't think about. We did think about uh, SON. Um, what do you mean by SON actually? So matrices, uh, yes, unitary matrices with uh, terminate one, right? But that's an infinite group. Yeah, but, but, uh, but there's it's still, there's still only finite. Yeah, so you can't, you, you can't have arbitrarily large product free sets in there? Um, yeah, but you can talk about the measure. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the method, so the method here is Fourier analytic and it proceeds by uh, proving some upper bounds on the weight of functions on certain levels. So this is what I mean by the method. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it a little, a little bit, but, uh, but this is what I mean. Right. Okay. I think in uh, SON, um, 
Gower has proved that the largest product preset has measure which grows, which decays like a power of n, and the the best examples decay like an exponential in n. So it's quite a big gap for SOM. Yes, yeah, so we we can we hope that uh, we can achieve an exponential bound, but uh, we don't have that. <coughs> okay, uh, very good. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our technique and what is going on. So, uh, so uh, Gauss uh, technique is uh, very nice. It's a very uh, sort of elegant application of basic representation theory. And to prove his result, Sean had to work harder and he had to pull uh, more uh, for MET tools. And we sort of start with the same place. So, uh, So uh, kind of in two words is for analysis. Uh, so this is something that we do have in common uh, with Sean, but uh, then uh, at some point we need to do something different, uh, obviously, otherwise we'll get the same result. So let me tell you a, a little bit about that. Okay, so in a very high level, um, whenever uh, one faces problems like that, it's very useful to look at, of obviously, the extremal examples that we have and see if they have any special, special structure. So in this case, this is uh, kind of the best examples that we have. And I claim that this family in some sense is very local. So if I were to uh, condition on uh, one uh, output of the permutation on pi of one, and I manage to force it to be like two, then the density of my family would jump from being one over root n to being a constant. So by restricting a single value of the permutation, we managed to change the, the uh, density of the family dramatically. And whenever you have something like that, the sort of method that I'm going to talk about uh, has a good chance of working. So the definition that I'm going to write now is sort of the main, maybe if, if you want to remember one thing from this talk, this is it. Um, so, uh, okay, so, sorry, not this definition, it's the second definition. This is a boring definition. So, uh, suppose I have a, a function from Sn to R, and I have a tuple of indices that are all distinct, and also J all distinct. Then I denote f i goes to j the restriction of f to pi's such that pi IK is equal to JK for K. Okay, so this is a kind of standard notion of restrictions. So in the example, what you should have in mind is F is the indicator set of the family and then a restriction that shows that the family has a special structure is like taking r equals one, let's say i equals one and j equals root n. So this is a, a good restriction to look at. So a function 
f from Sn to R is called R epsilon global if for all restrictions of size R, if you look at the restricted function and you compute its two norm, so two norm here is with respect to the uniform measure over permutations that uh, send I to J, this is at most epsilon. Okay. So this is really uh, kind of the key definition that I want you to take from this talk. And again, in the example, if you look at F, which is the integrator of A, F is not um, one uh, omega of one global. Because again, you have this restriction, these restrictions that bump your density to be constant. Could you just clarify what that L2 norm is over? So are we thinking of F from I to J as being a function on SN or just on this restricted set of permutations? Just on the restricted set of permutations and the L2 here. So I'm writing this a little bit informally. So the L2 here is simply the expectation of all permutations that send i to j of f by squared. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so formally, you have to say that the domain is smaller, and then it just uniform for measure. So does this, in particular, imply that the L two norm of f itself on S n is smaller? So now that you're taking, uh, so like, let's say, say that R is equal to one. So you're taking your uh, conditional event with probably one over N. So there could be a factor of N gap between, uh, okay, so you're saying that if you're global, then your L2 is uh, most epsilon. On S, it just feels like you ought to get that by averaging over all choices. Yeah, yeah. Of J. Yes, but what can happen is that your, L2 of F is small, but then you have some restriction that has very large L2. Right. Yeah. Good. Uh, very good. So what is so special about these global functions? Um, so there is a, a tool, like uh, maybe the key tool uh, in a nice Boolean functions, that uh, helps you prove many, many things. So uh, this is called uh, the hypercontractive inequality or hypercontractivity. Uh, so this is a useful uh, in analysis of one functions. And in particular, if you had some inequality like that, uh, over the symmetric group, then you'd be very happy. You'd be able to prove uh, results like that without uh, any effort at all. So what does this inequality tell us? So let me just say like very, very roughly. Uh, the statement of it. So I don't want to make too, too many definitions, so I'm going to be kind of rough. So here is one setting. So suppose we have some function G over the hypercube and we think of it as uniform measure to is and Okay, so let's say plus minus one, uh, which is a multilinear polynomial. Okay, 
of degree at most D. Um, then hyperconductivity allows you to compare different norms of G. So for example, it tells you that if you look at the fourth norm of, of, uh, of G, which is always at, uh, at least the two norm of G simply by convexity, it turns out that this is at most a constant times the two norm of G. Okay, so this is a, a very useful result in uh, analysis and there are many, many applications of it. But unfortunately, we don't have anything like that for the symmetric group. And the reason is very simple. So you can take like the function g of pi, which is one, only if pi of one is equal to one. Um, so I didn't define what degree is for functions over SN, but really any notion of degree that is reasonable would say that the degree of G is one. Um, but at the same time, you can compute that the two norm of G is like one over N to the fourth, and the two norm is one over root N, so uh, it fails. Um, but what turns out to be the case, and this is somewhat motivated from this example, is that if your function is global, then you're able to improve upon this inequality considerably. So this is a joint work with Filmus, Kindler, and Lifshitz, and myself. So this tells you that uh, if you're a function on the symmetric group of degree D and G is 2D epsilon global, Then, uh, if you look at the form of G, but actually you can look at like the Q norm even, then for all Q greater than two, uh, the two norm of Q is at most Q to the sum constant that depends on D times uh, epsilon to the minus minus two over Q times G to the to norm of g to the power of 2 over q. Um, so one case that just for sanity check, if we had our function to be very global, if epsilon was the 2 norm of g, if we never managed to increase uh, the 2 norm with restrictions, then we'd recover the original hyperconductive inequality. Right, because then the power is just set up to, to one. But in, the, in general, this is what we can prove. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, so this is uh, what global hyperconductivity is. And now uh, I want to let, tell you a little bit about uh, how we proceed in the argument for a, and then I'll, we'll uh, reach some point in time that we need, we'll need some result about the level one weight, and then I'll tell you quickly what is happening. So uh, how to uh, bound the size of what are three sets in AM.
So we have our set A and we define the indicator of it. Now, first of all, we need to uh, use some sort of Fourier analytic decomposition. And the decomposition that we'll need is only kind of a level decomposition. We don't need more than it. So let me quickly tell you what it is. So uh, if we have a restriction i, j of size d, we say that the indicator of pi i goes to j is a function of degree d. So this is the, the most basic definition. Secondly, if we have some parameter d, then the linear space vd is the span of degree d functions as defined above. And lastly, again, we have our d. We define a function of pure degree d V equals D to be the intersection of V D with the perpendicular space to V D minus one. Again, with respect to the inner product with, uh, with the uniform measure. So this is the level decomposition that we use. This is something that is kind of generic. You don't need too much structure for that. But it immediately follows that you can write your function f as f equals zero plus f equals one plus dot dot, dot plus f equals uh, n minus one, where f equals d is from the space v equals d. So now we want to count products. So how do we do that? So to count products, we need to look at the expectation when we take pi and tau uniform for a n of f pi f tau f by composed with tau. And if we manage to show that this expression is greater than zero, we'll be happy. So what do you do? Well, the first step is you plug in your degree decomposition. And after some uh, not too difficult arguments, you get that this expectation is equal to the sum of contributions from all of the degrees. D equals one, uh, zero to the minus one. Expectation of F equals D pi, F equals D tau, F equals D pi composed with tau. Good. So what do we do now? Well, now there is uh, one important D that we need to look at. So what is F equals zero? So if you look at definition, a degree zero function is a constant function. So F equals zero is uh, the closest uh, constant function to F. And it probably would not surprise you that the closest uh, constant function to f in two norm is its expectation. So from d equals zero, you get expectation of a to the third. And then you get 
the contribution from level one. Plus the rest. So far, uh, we didn't say anything special. Now, what turns out to be the case, and this is sort of the main point of Gower's argument, is that you can use basic representation theory to argue that unless A was very large, the magnitude of the rest is small when compared to uh, the expectation to the third of A. So this is essentially uh, Gower's argument. So really, after you do all of that, the question becomes how negative can this level one uh, contribution be? So to answer this question, we need to know a little bit more about how this level one uh, component looks like. And I'll simply tell you a formula for it. So if you look at the level one component, you can write it as summation over all i and j, some coefficient a i j, indicator of i goes to j. And what in, is interesting about this is that this uh, coefficient aij exactly capture the gain that you get from the corresponding restriction. So let me get the formula right. So you have some annoying factor times the difference in measures when you do the restriction and when you do not. So now this sort of becomes interesting because you sort of know that uh, if you manage to find some coefficient that is large, then it means that you found some piece of that original family that we had uh, inside your family. So it makes sense to see, uh, to start to plug that in and see what you get uh, when you compute this expectation. And computing, uh, we get that this expectation, double star, and I'm cheating it a little bit, but not too much, is a very nice formula. Um, so there is some normalization factor, one over n squared, um, times summation ijk, the coefficient ij, uh, jk, and ik. And this is kind of interesting because it's uh, three restrictions that are compatible with products. Because if I have some permutation that takes i to j, some permutation that takes J to K, then I know that the product takes I to K. So this is a good sign. And the idea here uh, try to find compatible restrictions. A I goes to J, A, A J goes to K. A, I goes to K with significantly larger measure. It 
if uh, double star is too negative. Okay, and this is indeed what we do. This is sort of a bit similar to Ross theorem uh, because it's sort of a sum of four coefficient to the third, but some slight variant of that. But I just want to say like one more thing. So how does that uh, go with global hyperconductivity? Where does that enter the picture? So what you can be worried about is that maybe all of these coefficients individually are very, very small. But somehow because the sum is large, uh, it becomes very negative. And this is where global hyperconductivity enters the picture. So using global hyperconductivity, we managed to prove an improved level one inequality or Chang's lemma, provided that all of the coefficients are very small. So formally, uh, we can prove that uh, if we look at the coefficients, we look at some squared, and we only look at small ones, then we can get much better bound than, uh, than the trivial one. So the trivial one is actually the two norm of F squared. But what we manage to get is, this is at most, um, so this is for all Q more than two. So we managed to prove that, so this is the trivial bound, two norm of S squared, this is by Parseval stuff. So we, we managed to improve that and get that it's almost two norm uh, of f to the fourth, except when uh, delta is not very, very small. So more precisely, this is something like um, up to some uh, power of Q. So using this improved level one inequality, we managed to show that if you look at the sum, then the contribution does not actually come from places where all of these or each one of these is simultaneously small. So there must be at least one or even two of them that are large. And then we're uh, in a better uh, shape to finish the argument. So you still need to do more work, but this is kind of uh, the key idea of how to use global hyperconductivity for this problem. And yeah, any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, so let me just say that uh, uh, this uh, blueprint of the proof that I showed, so this is actually, uh, if you want to get the cost result or any of the things that I said earlier, or even the stability result, the proof is kind of the same. Just uh, you, you need to say something a little bit different in the end, but um, yeah, but this is it. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, uh, thank you for listening.